Esther chapter 4, starting at verse 12 and reading through verse 14. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We come to the end of a very rich and wonderful conference, a great time of fellowship, of, of challenge, of encouragement. Lord, we thank you for the way that you have moved in all of our lives. And Father, as we come to this time now, as we look into your word, and we look into this phrase that has been our theme uh, during our entire conference, Father, we pray that you would make it alive to us. Help us to understand the meaning of these words for such a time as this. Help us, Father, to apply it to our lives and apply it to the places where you have planted us. We thank you and praise you for this. In Christ's name, amen. In the face of pressing realities, how does one discern the times? What does this phrase, for such a time as this, mean to us? Uh, we, we've had a, a great conference. I, I, I've heard that from many quarters. I think all would agree that this has been a wonderful conference. Uh, we have been challenged and encouraged. We've heard some, some great uh, speakers. Uh, it has caused us to, to think and consider and bring ideas back to our, our, our home communities and cities, and uh, we're kind of motivated and charged up and pumped up, and, and we're just excited about ministry at this point. But um, guess what? Y'all have to go home. Y'all have to go home. Now, this year has been different for me. I, I have had a different experience here at the conference, um, be, being a part of the, um, the, the, the host committee, I never left home, this is my home. And so while y'all are here sitting and you're, you're listening to Barbara Skinner and you're, and you're eating up all of her words, I'm sitting there too trying to do the same thing, but I also hear this little voice next to me that says, Daddy, I'm thirsty. Um, Dad, I'm bored. When is this going to be over? Uh, you know, I, I'm here listening to, to all of this. And so I, you know, home has a way of, of bringing you back to reality. And uh, we're all going home. You know, I almost missed my award. I almost missed it. I was out in the back talking to, is Heidi in here? Is Heidi here? She's probably out in the back. I wanted to embarrass I wanted to embarrass her a little bit, but she's still working. Because if you want to know the person that really pulled this thing together, uh, uh, it's Heidi. Uh, she is just a marvelous uh, organizer and behind the scenes. And, and uh, uh, Cheryl, if you're still here, uh, you need to find a Heidi. You won't be able to get Heidi. We had a hard enough time getting Jeff, her husband, to give her up to do this thing. So she's not going to go to Philadelphia, but uh, you need to find a Heidi in your, in your city um, because she was just, just absolutely marvelous. But I was out in the back talking to Heidi, and she was trying to sneak me in here. said, so, you know, uh, what, uh, Ted, hmm, what's up next? Hmm, looks like the awards are next. Don't you want to go in? I said, no, I'm going to go check around here and see what's going on. See, I'm home, see? And, you know, home has a way of, of, of bringing you back to reality. You may go home, and for the first few days, you may still be pumped up, you may still be excited, but those same problems, those same issues, uh, the lack of money, um, the personnel problems, all of those things are still there. 
uh, you're going to go home and face real problems. In the face of pressing realities, how does one discern the times? What does this phrase, for such a time as this, mean to us? Now, Esther faced a similar problem. Uh, we have the advantage as we read the book of Esther to see the whole story from beginning to end. But that was not the case with Esther. She was living it out. Esther, like us, lived life one day at a time. Uh, she lived at a time um, when the Persians were in power. Uh, she lived at a time when uh, King Xerxes was, was the king. And uh, he was not that good of a king. In fact, they say the Persian Empire began to um, crumble under, under his reign. Well, Esther's a, a Jewish girl that uh, was born into captivity. And she's living there with, with other Jews in, in Susa. And uh, uh, she happens to be uh, a good-looking girl. And uh, unbeknownst to her, um, Vashti, the queen, decides to get uppity and doesn't want to do what uh, Xerxes wants her to do, and so he puts her out. And then after a while, he says, well, I need a new queen. So he goes out, and he goes out, and he finds, finds all these good-looking girls, says, bring them in, and I want to see them one by one, and the one I like the best, I'm going to be queen. And in those days, you had to do that. You know, if you were good-looking and you were in the land, the king said, you come, you come. And so that's what Esther did. And so she went, and she happened to find favor with this king. Uh, and so the king brings her into the house, and now she is now, she is now the queen. Now, Esther was also raised by her uncle, Mordecai. Now, she lost her parents. Doesn't really talk a whole lot about how she lost her parents, but she lost her father and her mother. And Mordecai, her uncle, raises her. Okay, this is what's happening to her as she lives at this, at this time. Um, uh, Mordecai uh, is a, a Jew and a very strong leader, and he has some place of prominence in the, in the kingdom. But there's another man that Esther probably didn't know about until she got into the, into the, uh, the palace, and this man is named Haman. And... And, and Haman is expecting everybody to bow down to him. And, and it has something to do with, with who Haman is and who Mordecai is, but Mordecai would not bow down to him. And Haman didn't like that. And so Haman decides, I'm going to work something out where I'm not just going to destroy Mordecai, I'm going to destroy all of his people. He decides to do that. And so what does he do? He goes to the king, works out a deal, and on a certain day, all of the Jews, not just Mordecai, but everybody, is going to get destroyed. So we find in chapter 4, that's kind of the background. Okay, that's the background where Esther is involved in the middle of this thing. Nobody knows, well, at least nobody in the court knows that Esther is a Jew. She's, he's, she's kept that secret because Mordecai told her to keep a secret. But now there's a major problem. All of the Jews in the kingdom are about to be destroyed, and all the Jews that existed lived in the kingdoms. That meant they were all going to be wiped out. We come to chapter 4, and we find Mordecai upset. And he's in sackcloth and ashes, and, and he's outside the palace. Esther's inside. She hears there's a problem, wonders what's wrong. She, she sends message, messages to him. She tries to get him clothes. She tries to do things. She can talk to him. She can't do that. She's through her messenger. She, she finds out what's wrong. The messenger comes back and tells her what is wrong, what's about to happen. And if you look at chapter 4 and verse... 11, we find Esther's first response to the problem. Her first response, she says, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that he be put to death. The only exception to this is for the king to extend the gold scepter to him and spare his life. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. And so what she does is she sends her first message back. And the first message is this, Mordecai, get real. 
This is the way things are done in the palace. You don't just go up to the king and ask him for this favor. In fact, there is a law, a law that says if anyone does that, they get killed. And so these are the realities. These are the circumstances. I can't go. That's what she says. Now, she has a second response after Mordecai responds to that first message. And between uh, her first response and her second response, Mordecai's words move Esther beyond the, the, the pressing realities to understanding the times. In the midst of real danger, she is able to make a decision that turns everything around for the good. The question we need to ask ourselves is, what did Mordecai say that enabled Esther to act? What did he do? What did he do to get her to see things differently and act in the midst of a dangerous, difficult situation and do the right thing? And how can his words help us discern the times that we live in? Let's take a look at them. First of all, look at verse 13. We find that the first thing he did was he challenged her thinking. He challenged her thinking. He says, it says, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, that he sent back this answer, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. He challenged her thinking. Okay, he got that message. First, he had explained to her the tremendous problem. He says, you've got to go before the king and, 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 and deal with this thing. You've got to go before him and make this wrong right. But then after Esther's response, he has a different response. He says, do not think. You, do you catch it? Do not think, child, that you will... He is dealing with Esther as a parent. He's dealing with her as a child. She's a child. He's the parent. And he's about to remind her of some things. You know, it's amazing to me, children do not change. They haven't changed in Esther's time, and they haven't changed today. They are the same way. Children act the same way. Son, you are home half an hour late. What happened to you? Well, um, uh, well, I was at my friend's house, and uh, uh, his, his dad wasn't home yet, and so I, I, I had to stay. Okay? Okay. Uh, Oh, I, I had, this thing came up and that thing came up, and so I, I couldn't do what you, supposed, what you told me to do. Uh, a whole list of circumstances that are supposed to excuse and explain away the right thing to do. The fact that you're supposed to do as I told you to do. Uh, it's really a twist on uh, Flip Wilson's The Devil Made Me Do It, except we blame it on circumstances. Okay? And so what was happening, Esther, in all this explanation, Mordecai, like a good parent, is saying, I'm not buying this at all. I see through this. And he responds, don't you think that you can do this? Esther was violating a couple of principles that Mordecai had taught her, and she, he needed to remind her. And the first one was that we live by principle, not by circumstance. We live by principle. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. She was a Jew. She was raised right. She knew God. She knew the principles of God's word. And she was to apply those principles to her circumstances. It didn't matter what the circumstances were. You live by principle, not by circumstance. And the second principle, or second uh, rule she was violating, was that you're to love your neighbor. You are your brother's keeper. Jeremiah 22, 16 says he defended the cause of the poor and needy, and so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord. To know God, knowing God means we care about what he cares about, and we reflect that concern in our actions. Uh, about a week before the conference, in order to get a little bit of R&R, my wife and I uh, went up to Estes Park, and um, uh, we just spent uh, the weekend up there. And as I was sitting, it was a beautiful day, and I was just sitting out. We were in a, in a little, little uh, eating establishment, 
and we were just looking at the mountains and just looking at Estes Park, I, I started asking myself um, a tough question. I said, if I lived up here, why would I have any concern at all for the poor? Why would I have any concern at all for the inner city? Why? And I asked my wife that question. And as I asked the question, as I thought about it, the answer was very clear. It's because God says so. His word has not changed. We care about people because we reflect the concern and interests of our Father. As his children, as his ambassadors, the concerns that we have for people come from our Father. He's instilled those in us. And as we are obedient to him, we must respond. We must respond. It's his character, his concerns. That's why. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter where you have been born. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter what your economic status is. It doesn't matter about the color of your skin. What matters is that you belong to God. And if you belong to God, you will represent him well. And his word is the same whether that Bible is sitting in the inner city or whether it's sitting in the suburbs, whether it's sitting in the mountain, no matter where it is sitting, all over the world, the scriptures are the same. This is our God and we serve him. How did Mordecai enable Esther to rightly discern the times? He challenged her thinking. He reminded her that you live by principle, God's principles, not by circumstances. We care because God cares. But then the next thing he did was he challenged her inaction. Notice in verse 14, he says, If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will come, will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. Okay, he picked up in what she said was that she was going to choose not to choose. She was going to choose to not respond. Okay, and yet to not decide is to decide. To not make a decision is to make a decision. And Mordecai, in reminding her of that, lets her know he gives two responses to that. His second one is that you won't get away with it. You won't get away with it. You and your family will perish. You can run but you can't hide. There is no place that is safe. See, the world has a view of safety. Uh, at least in America we do. Uh, it's a, you, you create a place where there's, there's no crime, there's no gangs, there's no, no any, anything that you think is unseemly or is not right. You create, you create this place, and it's called suburbia. And suburbia is considered safe, okay? God's definition of safety is the place where he puts you. When you are where God has called you to be, you are safe. Suburbia is not a safe place for me. It is not a safe place for my family. It is not a safe place for my children or my wife because that's not where God has placed me. You are safe where God has called you to be. That is the place of safety. And the circumstances are irrelevant. It is where God wants you to be. And so you won't get away with it. That's the second thing he tells her. The first thing he tells her is that God is going to do it with or without your help. Okay? Deliverance will arise from another place. God will save his people. See, long ago, God made a promise to Abraham. He said, Abraham, look at the stars. Look at all the stars. As numerous as the stars are, so shall your descendants be. God made a promise. He was going to reveal himself through his chosen people. And he's not going to have his people destroyed. God is going to be God, and God is going to care for his people. He's going to fulfill his promise. He is going to demonstrate his character. He is going to continue to be God. And so that means Haman's plan is not going to work. 
And so, Esther, if you choose not to respond, if you choose not to act, that's okay because God will do it another way. He has a will, and he's going to get it done. So how did Mordecai enable Esther to rightly discern the times? He challenged her. He challenged her in action. He, he reminded her that you are only safe when you are where God wants you to be and you're doing what God has called you to do. And God will do what he wants to do, with or without you. Then thirdly, and it's important we understand that it's thirdly, that he challenged her perspective. And that's where he says in the latter part of verse 14, um, and who knows but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. It's important we understand that this comes after challenging her thinking by reminding her that she is to live by God's principles and not worldly circumstances. It doesn't matter what the times are, what, where, she, where she lives, the country, whatever. It doesn't matter. What matters is she lives by God's principles, not worldly circumstances. But he also challenged her in action by reminding her that God will move. He will do what he has promised. He will do it with or without her. But now having said that, he now challenges her perspective. He says, look at this a different way. You, 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 you have a cup and you fill it half with water. Is the cup half empty or is it half full? It's a matter of perspective. I can remember when I first gave my life to Christ, I happened to have been overseas studying. And I had given my life to Christ, and it was in October of 74. And, uh, and I, it was great. I was surrounded by, by missionaries and these wonderful people, and I was so excited. There was just one problem. I had to go home. I had a ticket. I had to go home for three weeks. I had to go back to my community for three weeks. And the thought of doing that scared me. And I went to the man that had led me to Christ, and I told him, this is how bad it is, man. I'm going back to the hood, and let me tell you how bad it is. And as I told him how bad it was, he started smiling. So I thought, well, maybe I haven't made it clear to him, so I, I shared some more things with him. I said, listen, this is really serious. It's really bad. I'm going to be around some folks, and, and these people are terrible influences, and I'm just a young Christian, and I don't know any Christians back there, and this is a serious problem, and the more I talk, the more he smiled. And finally, he just busted out laughing. And in the laughter, he said, what a tremendous opportunity. <laughs> it's a matter of perspective. And I've learned that perspective. In fact, now, one of the things, one of the, one of the things I talk about with, with young people is this whole matter of, of options. You know, poverty isn't just lack of wealth, it's lack of options. And I like that, that quote from uh, James T. Kirk. Anybody here... Star Trek fans. I'm a Star Trek fan. And uh, um, uh, James T. Kirk in, in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, he made this statement, I don't believe in the no-win scenario. See, he starts out with this, uh, 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 this simulation at Starfleet, and, and all the cadets have to go through this impossible situation, and Kirk was the only one that made it through. And the reason he made it through is because he changed the conditions of the test. He got in there and fiddled with the computer and worked it out. So he, he's the only person that ever thought of doing that and ever did it. So he's the only one that ever did And so he says, I don't believe in the no-win scenario. And I'm constantly challenging our young people to consider your options. There are options there. You have been trained to not see them, but they are there. It's a matter of perspective. Mordecai helped Esther see beyond what was in front of her eyes to the divine opportunity was there. He helped her to see for such a time as this. Well, Esther responded. We find in verse uh, 15, it says that Esther sent this, mess this reply to Mordecai, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. 
When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So she responded. She responded. You know, we do not choose the times that we live in. We don't choose that. We don't choose our parents. We don't choose our, the, our, the place that we're born, um, to whom we're born. Uh, we, don't, we don't choose those things. Esther didn't choose the time that she was living in. She didn't choose to lose her parents. She didn't choose to go to Mordecai. She didn't choose to live in, in, in Persia, where the king could just come and just, just at will, just, just take her out of her, her family and bring her into the palace. Uh, she, she didn't choose to be beautiful. She didn't choose to, to, to be chosen by the king to be brought into the palace. Uh, she didn't choose to have a Haman around that would threaten the extinction of her, of her people. She did not choose any of that. We do not choose the circumstances that we are in. We don't choose the times that we live in. But we are God's people. And as God's people, we are called to live for him in the midst of whatever circumstances he puts us in. It doesn't matter what generation it is. As God's people, the mandate is the same. We are to live for him in the midst of the society that he has put us in. And so therefore, we must answer the question. In the face of pressing realities, how does one discern the times? For what does for such a time as this mean to us? In order to answer the question, we need to listen to Mordecai. Mordecai told Esther, you are responsible. Meaning you are able to respond. You have been taught the principles of God's word. And they are to be lived out no matter what the circumstances are. You live by God's principles, not by circumstances, not by the problems that are around you. You face those problems in the light of what God has taught you and what God has made you to be. And recognize that as you are responsible, understand that God will move. God will move. God is God. He has a plan. He has an agenda. And he is going to carry it out. He is faithful to his promises. He will fulfill his will, and he will do it with or without you. But because he wants to do it with you, behold the opportunity. Behold the opportunity that is in front of you. Look at where God has positioned you. You are where you are for such a time as this. What does that mean? I can think of some examples. I can think of when neighborhood got started. And I can think, I remember that day when, when uh, I left Youth for Christ staff to stay with this handful of kids to start neighborhood ministries. And I got a call from, um, from, uh, from one, of the, one of the high ups. I, I, if I mentioned the name, you'd know him. And he called me up and he was upset that I was leaving. And he says, you're just going to get out there and you're just going to die and you're going to fail. You're not going to make it. That's what he said. And that's what he was looking at. And it, it, the circumstances didn't look too good. But I look at those circumstances. And then I look at God's word. And I look at his promises. And I look at the people in my community. And I look at the things that he's stirring up in my heart as far as what he wants to do, the changes he wants to make, the witness he wants to have in the community. And I look at that. And I look at the, I look at the, the situation. And I look, at, I look at the situation in the light of God's word. And I say, for such a time as this, I will do it. I can remember a year later after courting my wonderful wife. And, and knowing that it was God's will that I marry this wonderful woman. And I remember hearing the messages and hearing the words, you can't marry a white woman. You can't do that. You do that. If you do that, people aren't going to support you. They don't like that sort of thing in society. Even Christians don't like that sort of thing. And so therefore, you can't do it. You're going to fail. And so I looked at that, and I looked at the circumstances, and then I looked at God's word. I looked at Moses and how God responded when people rose up because they didn't like the fact that this Jew married an Ethiopian. 
I looked at God's word and looked what it said regarding reconciliation and what that means. And I looked at the circumstances and I looked at them through God's word. And I said, no, God, you can make a difference here. You can raise it up, even though society doesn't like this. For such a time as this, we'll do it. We'll do it. And then I can remember as time went on in the ministry, we had some struggles early on. And there are some people that were saying, you know, you can, you can help these folks a little bit, but really inner city kids, they're, they're, so many of them just damaged beyond repair. Really. I mean, you really need to temper your expectations. I mean, really, to raise up leaders... To take somebody that's, 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 that's been in, in gangs and has been on the streets and take people like that and to think that you could give them responsibility, to think that they could rise up and actually be leaders? No, that's not going to happen. I mean, the damage is too great. It's not going to happen. So I looked at that and looked at those circumstances, and then I looked at God's Word. And what does God say? What does he say about raising up people? The fact that, that, that God is, is able to save. Nothing is impossible with God. And God will take the, the, the lowest and, and the weakest and, and, and the ugliest. And he will transform them and make them his people. And he will empower them. And he will make them leaders. He will enable them to lead. He will enable them to make a change. So I looked at the circumstances. And I looked at God's word. And again, I looked at the circumstances through God's word. And I said, no, there's something different going on here. There is an opportunity here. There's an opportunity to bring glory to God, to show his agenda for such a time as this. We will do it. That's what it means. For such a time as this, it means that you are in a position where God has put you and he can work through you to show his agenda to a watching world. That's what it means. And we all have it. You're going home. And from many of you, from most of you, your problems have not changed. They have not changed. And yet God has put you there. How are you going to respond to your circumstances? I want to challenge you to consider three things. First of all, as you're going home, I know you have so much information, so many things you've learned, so many things you want to try. But I want to encourage you. As you're going home, I want you to think about the problems you face going home. Get them firmly in your mind. In fact, write them down on a piece of paper. And then as you write them down, and write them on one side of the paper. On the other side, begin to write down the principles that God has taught you in his word. The principles, the promises that relate to the problems that you have. Also, as you're writing down those problems, I also challenge you to write down, to think about what, what causes you to be afraid. What keeps you from moving? What keeps you from, 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 from moving out, from, from launching out and just, just going ahead and doing what God wants you to do? You're scared, something's holding you back. I challenge you to think about that and to write that down, that same side of the page. And then on the other side, write down God's promises. What, whatever comes to mind, when I'm afraid, I will put my trust in him and God whose word I praise. And God, I, I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? Whatever verses come to mind, think about them, write them down. And then once you've done those two things, then I challenge you to sit back and look at your community and to begin to dream about the possibilities. Look again at your community. Consider, cons consider the possibilities. Consider the opportunities. Look at them and say, God, if you are God and your word is true and you've put me here, then what are the possibilities for ministry? What could you do with me to make a difference in this place? And as you think about that, write down on the bottom of the page for such a time as this.
There is a verse in Scripture that uh, gives a great picture of what we're talking about. And uh, forgive me, those of you from Jubilee, you've heard this before. Um, but it's Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with endurance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. And to me, when I, when I think about that verse, I think about Mile High Stadium. And you can think about the stadium in your city, okay? But imagine yourself in this huge football stadium. And you are standing in the center of the stadium, okay? And in the bleachers, the bleachers are filled with people. They are filled with witnesses. They are filled with the people in the past, maybe it's your parents, your grandparents, but going all the way back to the beginning of time of people that have lived for God. And they are shouting at you. They're seeing you in the center of the stadium. And they're saying, this is your time. This is your time. You know, be what God has called you to be. Do what God has called you to do. It's your generation. He has raised you up in your generation to do the special work for him that he has called you to do. And you hear, you hear that. The witnesses are, are shouting at you. And it's an exciting image because one day, one day... We're going to be in the bleachers. It's going to be our children in the center of the stadium. And when they're in the stadium and they look up and they see us, what are they going to hear? What will they hear? Will they look at you and see you silent because you didn't move? Because you didn't see the opportunity that was before you? Because of all the pressing promises, you didn't apply the principles of God's word that enabled you to see through those circumstances to see what the real opportunity was right before you. Or will they hear you say, this is your time. I did it in my time. I did what God had called me to do. I, I, I lived as God called me to live. I saw the opportunities and I did it. Now this is your time. This is your time. Do it. Be what God has called. He is the same. He has not changed. He has a dynamic work for you to do in the midst of your world, your society, that has its whatever way of thinking it has. God is still God, and he wants to demonstrate. He wants to glorify his name through you. Don't miss the opportunity because you are there for this time. You are there for such a time as this.